A book launch in the University of Minnesota Duluth Library is where professor and author Dr. Eric Reddix presents what he learned while researching the death of 19th century Ojibwe chief Joe White. Joe White uh, became the chief of the community at Rice Lake, Wisconsin, which is about uh, 50 miles south of the Lacouture Reservation. And when he became the chief in um, 1878, the federal government wanted him and his community to remove to Lacouture to stay on the reservation. And he basically, from 1878 till his death in 1894, it, it was all about resisting that. And first it was the federal government that pushed that, then increasingly local settlers and local governments kind of pushed him to remain off the reservation. And the, and the, the incident of the murder of Joe White, uh, it's the state of Wisconsin. These are state game wardens who served Joe White with a warrant for his arrest for hunting off reservation, which, uh, you know, we have treaty rights that guarantee us these rights. And um, the state of Wisconsin was not recognizing these rights, so the judge issued this warrant for his arrest, and they sent him up there. And um, these two game wardens, uh, in the course of arresting him, which is a very kind of contemporary story almost, um, claimed that you know he stepped back when they tried to arrest him, and they started beating him. And when he got away from the beating and ran away, they shot him in the back, fatally shooting him. So, um, so you can see how like. You know, as I mentioned, all these different entities are involved with, you know, trying to get this man and his community to stay on the reservation where Indians belonged in their view. I grew up and, you know, you hear about, you know, people like, uh, you hear about, you know, Lakotas and Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull and how they resisted the government. And you hear about the, maybe the Trail of Tears and how they were, you know, forced by Bayonet to go to Oklahoma. And those are stories we're familiar with, but I was like, well, what was our story? Well, you know, what, why did people go to the reservation? Why would you do something like that? Why would you sign a treaty? Why would you, you know, leave your home and go to a reservation? It just didn't make sense to me without those big stories like we're familiar with, with the Lakota and the Cherokee. And, you know, that's kind of what pushed this. And, you know, what I found was very complicated. And it, and it wasn't like a big federal government, you know, coming in with an army and doing something. It was... You know, sometimes the federal government was on the side of the Ojibwe and Joe White's community. Sometimes they were against it. Sometimes the, the timber company was, was uh, you know, supporting what, what they were trying to do. But then, you know, the timber company also flooded our rice beds. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a complicated kind of thing. And, it's, and you know, I, ha I have more answers now, but they're not, you know, they're not kind of, I guess, the there's no real like super bad guy in the story. I mean, there's just these different forces that are kind of impacting Native people and Ojibwe people. The murder of Joe White has received critical acclaim for an in-depth analysis of a little-known event from Wisconsin history. So they shoot uh, Joe White and, um, you know, they just leave. They leave the scene and it was about, uh, you know, from the county seat of Washburn County, it was about... Um, I'd, I'd say about 15 miles on foot they walked and they just left the body sitting there with his family. So, I mean, kind of a tr really tragic thing, that short-term kind of image, you know, if you think about it. So, um, they're eventually placed under arrest um, and they stand trial three months later at which they're found uh, not guilty of manslaughter and they're acquitted by an all-white jury, most of which were um, immigrants from Scandinavia and they had a real similar view of um, Native people. and. They also felt that, you know, Joe White himself and his community belonged on the reservation and away from them. His father, Nana Ungabi, was uh, the leader from Le Coudre, uh, probably the most prominent leader from Le Coudre, and arguably, I talk about in the book, probably one of the most influential in all of uh, what, what later became Wisconsin. Um, and he was really responsible for, he was the chief that kind of negotiated with the government during the treaties. And he often, you know, was at odds with the federal government. But he was such a charismatic leader that I talk about, you know, the Indian agent, uh, Henry Schoolcraft, saying that, you know, having a lot of respect for him, even though a lot of times he was going against what Schoolcraft wanted him to do. So, um, but he meets a violent death right after the Treaty of 1854 is signed, which created the Lacoudre and other Lake Superior Ojibwe reservations. He's uh, killed on the battlefield against the Dakota. So, um, Nana Ungabi, his son, succeeds him, and this is Joe White's brother, Wabasheshi. Wabasheshi was a very different kind of leader, and he, um, he had a very um, more pragmatic approach, and he basically disassociates with the federal government and tries to build a relationship with settlers and the lumber company at Rice Lake. And he's the chief for 22 years, but you know, during that time, there was all these stresses on the community. 
um, the building of dams which flooded wild rice beds. You know, Rice Lake, Wisconsin, there's no ri rice on Rice Lake anymore. It's totally obliterated by the dam. So, um, and that was an important food source for Ojibwe people. And so all that stress kind of culminates in, uh, he's a, Wabash Ashe's assassinated in 1877. And then Joe White secedes him and, you know, 16 years later, he meets a violent death. Dr. Reddix hopes the takeaway for those in attendance is yes, this is Native history, but it is also Wisconsin history, and to a larger degree, it is American history. I want people to know who these leaders are, their names. You know, I mean, if you live, if you're a non-Native person, you live in Rice Lake, Wisconsin, you should know that there was a very, like, significant leader named Mena Ungaby who lived here, you know, and, and, and was the chief of a community for decades. And I didn't know about it growing up. And I think some of the descendants know of these people, but they don't really know their story, and especially they don't really know their personality. So that was my main kind of goal, is to have these people shine through. Because, you know, even though we're in the 21st century, we still suffer from this thing where our history is so ethnocentric. And we know about George Washington, and we know about Abraham Lincoln, and we know their personality. And, you know, when I started writing this book, a few people knew Nana Ungavi or Joe White or, well, nobody knew who Wabashe she was, but um, people might know their name and know they were descended from a chief and that's all they knew. And that was the minority of people. Nobody, I mean, most people didn't even know their names. So I'm hoping that this book kind of helps that and helps to balance out that, you know, yes, there were important, you know, native leaders and there were important native leaders besides the ones that we know about.